John with us. Um, he's just been with our MR students for the afternoon, and you know, kindly agreed to really work for his um, work for his, during his time here by also giving a lecture. Um, Adam is uh, one of those rare people who is able to operate equally comfortably in the design studio, uh, in the lecture theater, in uh, research seminar. Thank you for turning out on a cold night to see this. Um, I've had great fun today with the MR students, so I hope you find this as enjoyable as I found your work. Um, so the talk is called White Hole and Orange Nest, for reasons which I hope will become clear by the end. Um, that was the abstract that I sent through. It's, Hugh asked me to talk about design research, so um, that's a theme underlying this talk. Um, there are also some coincidences involved, which I'll talk about in a bit as I go. Specifically, it's to do with uh, a book which I've just uh, finished the manuscript of, co-written with Stephen Thornton, who's a political historian at Cardiff University, about Leslie, Ma Leslie Martin's plan to demolish and rebuild Whitehall in London in 1965. Um, so it's about that on the one hand. It's also about some projects that I've been involved with recently through what we call the Design Office at Newcastle University, which is a um, uh, design research practice, which I lead. Uh, and we've done some work lately on some projects, or, 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 some projects which have reworked some, build, some mid 1960s buildings on the Newcastle campus. And there are all sorts of interesting connections, it seems to me, between the book and the project. So I'm going to talk to you about both of those and about how they go together, and about how they might together constitute design research, if that makes sense. So, um, research then, if I had to give a definition, I would say it's an original contribution to the culture of the discipline. Architects, in practice, when they find things out, often talk about doing research. But in that sense, it seems to me what, that they might be finding out things for themselves, but they're not necessarily conducting the kind of research that makes a contribution to the culture of the discipline. So it's a, the, the kind of research that I want to talk about today is research defined in that way, which is more or less, seems to me, how universities like to define research and how we think about it. Um, so, a few years ago, I finished a book called Heidegger's Hut, which was looking at Martin Heidegger's um, Retreat in the Black Forest Mountains of Southern Germany. Uh, and that was the book on the left, published by MIT Press. At the same time, I was working on a house in practice, which is this, this house on the right, uh, a place called Newbridge on Wye, in, Black, in uh, the Black Mountains of South Wales. And there were an uncanny series of connections between the hut and the house, not least south facing mountain slope. Um, the fact that one's the Black Forest, one's the Black Mountains, the fact that the only real way to place a building on this site was to bury it in a slope like Heidegger's hut. Um, so there are all sorts of interesting overlaps, some of them productive, some of them slightly frightening. Um, so that was one, uh, that was one coincidence. Uh, 
And I think I've been quite lucky in my own research, my own um, practice, that uncanny co coincidences have happened between the writing that I've been doing and the buildings that I've been working on. I've been incredibly lucky. I haven't set it up that way. It's just happened. Um, but it's a good thing. So the coincidence that I'm going to talk about today is, as I say, the coincidence between the Whitehall book on the one hand and these projects looking at buildings built at almost exactly the same time with a very similar set of ideas from the Newcastle campus. So I'm going to start with the book, um, available in all good bookshops from November. Uh, so uh, this is Whitehall in London. Uh, the image on the left, up there, can I find the laser pointer? Yes, is a model from the report that Leslie Martin submitted to the <coughs> government showing the existing condition of Whitehall. Um, that's the Houses of Parliament, that's Westminster Abbey, that's the Foreign Office by George Gilbert Scott, which is this building, that's the Treasury um, by J.M. Bryan, which is this building, is the, kind of the, the kind of pompous palaces of state. Um, and you can see by comparing that model, which is the before model, with that model, which is the after model, um, how much of Whitehall was um, being considered for redevelopment. Not a modest project, yes. <laughs> um, so what Martin proposed was demolishing these historic palaces of state and replacing them with a ziggurat section megastructure built in concrete, um, which would reframe the Houses of Parliament and Westminster Abbey. Incredibly ambitious project. And in the book, one of the things that we're really interested in is how this project is a very particular manifestation of a very particular point in history. Um, so, this is Harold Wilson, Prime Minister, uh, whose government to which uh, Martin submitted the Whitehall Report. He became Prime Minister in 1964. In 1963, he gave a speech at the Labour Party conference in that year where he talked about the new Britain that would be founded in the white heat of the technological revolution. Uh, Wilson used, partly tactically, partly tapping into the spirit of the time, used the idea of technology, of a new technological future, of the idea that this technological future was not just um, a long way hence, but imminent, um, as a way to unite his party, to promote uh, labour against what appeared at that point to be a very... Uh, Ed, a very sort of uh, patrician Edwardian Conservative Party who were in government led by uh, Douglas Hume, the 14th Earl of Hume. Uh, so Wilson, to some extent opportunistically, was using technology and meritocracy to position his party against the Conservatives, but also he was tapping into a very particular moment in British history. This is um, you know, the, the beginning of the, of the jet age, the computer age, these were terms that Wilson used, um, to talk about what he considered to be an imminent new future within reach, which could be planned for now. This was also a time when planning was incredibly um, fashionable, not just planning in terms of uh, town planning, but planning in the sense of economic planning. The Wilson government was the first, British, first and only British government ever to have a national plan, uh, which was a total disaster. Um, but also, planning was incredibly current in all sorts of disciplines, from economics through science. Um, the idea of a predictable, scientifically controlled technological future um, in the hands of experts. Also related to that was the idea of meritocracy. Michael Young published his book, The Rise of the Meritocracy, in 1959. Um, and also very current at this time was the idea of replacing an Edwardian public school establishment with another kind of uh, British society, 
where anybody could potentially ride to the top. Wilson um, himself was a grammar school boy from Huddersfield, not the conventional British elite. Um, Wilson, uh, sorry, uh, Leslie Martin too, was from Manchester, um, although he ended up as Professor of Architecture in Cambridge, by no means conventional um, background, I suppose. Uh, and you know, the, the, the meritocracy, <coughs> uh, the, oh, the, the, the merit that the meritocracy had was assumed to be largely scientific. In this new scientific technological future, um, you know, the, the best brains would be the people behind the kind of projects that would drive science, for, that would drive science forward and society forward. You know, this is the time of the moonshots, it's the time of Concord, um, also of high-rise housing. So, uh, technology, meritocracy, uh, and the future were associated together um, as, uh, in terms of, a kind of uh, an imminent new age. It was also the time of the Cold War, with uh, all sorts of liberating domestic appliances and all sorts of uh, apocalyptic munitions proliferating. And behind that was a faith in political, professional and scientific experts, which was dimmed by the end of the 1960s, but um, in the mid-60s was still very um, uppermost. So, what we've argued in the book is that there is a very particular era, in, uh, a very particular moment in British history between Wilson's white heat of technology speech in 1963 and the Sterling crisis of 1966, at which point faith in the technological experts started to unravel. Um, and as well as having Wilson up there, we've also got this advert which comes from catalogue of the Building Trades exhibition in 1965, an exhibition which happened to open on the day when Martin submitted his report to the government. Um, and, you know, it's better with radiation, you need it less often, it's radiation heating, but it's claiming you know, the authority of the, of the kind of nuclear power and this, this amazing technology. Um, and the hero of this is the white-coated scientist. So, the Whitehall plan, we argue in the book, is the, is, is the ultimate architecture of white heat. This is uh, the architectural manifestation of that particular moment in British history, arguably the definitive architectural manifestation of that moment in British history. Um, and it's fascinating in terms of its functional optimization. The report um, shows how the design is derived from this graph. Now, unfortunately, <coughs> the line quality of this image isn't brilliant, so you can't really make it out completely. And also, I tend to use this as a prompt to remind me what they, what that graph, how that graph actually works, so I don't have to look on here. Um, so, what this is about is comparing uh, land use with clerical density with net to gross ratio. So, um, you can, it's looking at effectively the number of civil servants that you can fit into a given space and then what kind of building that means on the site. So this gives rise to a whole series of possibilities from which the design could be derived. It allows the, allows the uh, technocrats to make a, a decision about the most optimum functional organisation of space on the site. And from that graph can then be derived a series of forms, possible forms, uh, from which one can be chosen, leading to the design. Um, and so the, mega, the, the layout of the mega, the mega structure, this is the block plan, this is the section, um, with a series of offices arranged around top-lit galleries, within which there was a deck for um, civil servants and the ministers, and then a public route, ground floor, um, and then this section was arranged around with a series of other tiered blocks into the a, a courtyard plan to make the megastructure, with a series of routes running um, in different directions through it. What's interesting is that in relation is, is that this project sits in relation to a whole series of other projects that were going on in the Martin office and in the Cambridge School of Architecture. Martin was at this point Professor of Architecture in Cambridge. 
Um, and the office and his group at the Department of Architecture and University there were fascinated by ideal building form. Um, the, the archetype for particular building types. They were interested in um, the ideal university building, the ideal lab, and this is an exercise in determining the ideal government office. So what they've done through the graph um, and through this process is to determine the ideal form for the government office building and then they go on to apply it to the site in Whitehall. So it's, it's the archetype applied to the site. This is a scientific expert setting out the possibilities as they saw it. And as part of this, uh, as part of that um, post-war era, as part of this uh, imminent new future, the architects saw themselves as replacing the old architecture of bombastic excess of ornament and of artistic connoisseurship with a new, efficient, meritocratic architecture for a new, efficient and meritocratic tomorrow. And as part of that, they felt that they were rejecting the idea of a long culture in favour of a scientific future. This is not an architecture which looks to the past, instead it's an architecture which almost turns its back on the past and instead is trying to claim this new um, technocratic, um, meritocratic future. So this is the project, it's worth running through it. Um, there were eight phases that were, that were proposed. The first was this, to build a new parliamentary building. Michael Hopkins built a building on this site 35 years later, um, which would have uh, beneath it a new underground station, a shopping concourse. It was originally intended as uh, decanting capacity, as it's called in the report, to allow the rest of the scheme to continue. The first phase here, um, actually, I'll tell you what, it's worth noting on that slide, pointing out some of the key buildings. So this is the Houses of Parliament, this is where Queen's <coughs> Abbey, this is the Foreign Office, this is the Treasury and the Great George Street building, this is Norman Shaw Scotland Yard, keep an eye on this one, we'll see what happens to that. Um, this is the uh, Middlesex Guildhall, which is now the Supreme Court. Um, and then this is Inigo Jones' banqueting house over here. Um, so, so uh, what happens next is the first, the second phase is, is the beginning of the megastructure proper with um, accommodation lining Whitehall, um, demolition around Scotland Yard. Next, the Foreign Office is demolished uh, to make way for uh, a series, an, another set of um, courtyard blocks. The report notes its contextualism in the way that the terraces stop here in order to make a setback in front of number 10 Downing Street. Uh, sensitive contextual response. Uh, in the fourth phase, the megastructure is completed. So this establishes east, west, and north, south galleries across the site. Room, the ministerial rooms are arranged along here, looking out across um, Parliament Square. Uh, and you kind of think, well, that's, that's a lot of development. We're only on phase four. Phase five uh, involves taking all the traffic from Whitehall and Parliament Square and putting it in a new tunnel in the river in order to pedestrianise Whitehall and pedestrianise this space. As part of this, there was a whole report by Colin Buchanan, author of Traffic, traffic in Towns, attached to it, um, showing how you could reorganise traffic in London in order to be able to achieve this. Um, so at this point, it's the pedestrian precinct here is complete. Um, and also you'll notice that Scotland Yard becomes locked as an object in that courtyard. Um, also, buildings here are demolished to make a better view of the banqueting house. And one of the really interesting things about this, this report is that um, it takes a very particular view to, of architectural history. Certain buildings are valued, certain buildings are not valued. When we interviewed Lionel March, who was one of the co-designers of the project about that, and said, you know, why, why, why Scotland Yard and not Middlesex Guildhall? And he said, oh, because we like them. Um, but I don't think that's completely true, actually. But it seems to me that, uh, I mean, obviously you guys know um, uh, persons 
pioneers of modern design, which was all about establishing modernism as the logical consequence of architectural history. And that's a book which values <coughs> certain kinds of architecture and doesn't value other kinds of architecture. It seems to me that what Martin and Arch were doing was, in a way, fulfilling the values of Pevsner's modern pioneers. You know, that, that um, Arts and Crafts Scotland Yard was good, um, the, the rather um, Slightly over the top neo Gothic Middlesex Guildhall was bad. The banqueting house uh, was was good, uh, and so the historical buildings that were deemed worthy of merit were somehow in this project to be freed of their context in order to be able to be viewed as objects of architectural history. It's a fascinating approach to history. It's not exactly rejecting the past, but it's instead constructing a selective history. Um, so the seventh phase of the project then uh, happens up here. It involves enclosing the top of Parliament Square with another office building, uh, Middlesex, I don't know what's called, uh, Westminster Central Hall, the Methodist place of worship remains. Uh, number six, interestingly, is described as a major building of national and international significance. And that's, that's all it's described as in the report. It seems as though it was intended to be government conference head government conference building, but that's how it's described. Um, and part of this was about uh, making terraces for viewing uh, national events. The eighth phase completes the project, completes the enclosure of Parliament Square. This is a set of um, residences. Interestingly, in the wake of the parliamentary expenses scandal in Britain in 2010, when MPs were found to be fiddling their expenses, one of the things that the media called for um, was you know, instead of paying for MPs to live in all sorts of nice flats around London, instead we should build halls of residence for MPs. And little did they know that Leslie Martin proposed it in 1965. This is a set of uh, residences for MPs. And if you actually if you look at buildings, at the roof plans are in place, you can't see it very well on this slide, but they correspond almost exactly to some of the roof plans. Uh, of Martin's Hall of Residence projects in Cambridge and in Hull and so on. So it really is a Hall of Residence for MPs. Um, and then at this point, uh, you know, new public uh, gardens are highlighted along here, on a deck in front of the Houses of Parliament and so on. Uh, and so what you're left with is a pedestrianised Parliament Square with gateways made by buildings that sail over the roads. Um, and you know, this is... This is the, uh, completed project as well. So, certainly ambitious, but it doesn't stop there. Um, there's also this diagram. Um, what I'm going to talk about now is, is constitutes about three pages of a 180 page report. But it's interesting that Martin's, Martin, at the press conference when he presented this to uh, the newspapers, I think it was 19, July 1965, apparently spent quite a lot of time talking about this. So, having set up this mega structure with its particular geometries, what you get um, are a series, a series of axes, and particularly this one. And Martin was interested that if you took this axis and extended it um, through the city, through the forecourt, Charing Cross Station, through Covent Garden, which doesn't appear on this drawing, to the British Museum, somewhere over there, two miles away, which Martin was also designing at this point, uh, or a scheme for a British, uh, British Museum library, later became the British Library, uh, at that point on a site at the British Museum. Um, you could, he said, bring into coherent relationship, not more than six minutes away, the National Gallery, the National Portrait Gallery, the Royal Upper House, the theatres and cinemas around Leicester Square, the British Museum and the National Library. Uh, you know, what he intended here was a grand axis through the fabric of London. Um, and there was at that point redevelopment going on in Covent Garden. Um, and this seemed not too inconceivable. Um, and he, in, you know, in, in, in the report, he demolishes huge swathes of London in just a few sentences. It's an illustration of the power of the technocratic, you know, the technological expert at that point. Um, but also it's an illustration of the idea of comprehensive planning. That uh, you know, this report came about because the government was, was doing, thinking of doing a series of projects in particular buildings, 
and instead decided that what they needed was a coherent strategy, a coherent plan to connect it all together. Um, that plan was incredibly, became incredibly wide-ranging, and even more wide-ranging still with this extension of the, the ground access through the city, through, through London. Um, so, this is another photograph of the model, and this one intriguingly has the dotted line on it of the ground access. Um, so there are, you know, it seems to me that the Whitehall plan can be read as an attempt to burnish the pride of the British state that at that point um, you know, felt itself to be impoverished by uh, war and divested of empire. Um, but on the other hand, it was also intent on demonstrating the value of technology as an instrument of popular salvation. It seems to me that simultaneously reinforcing and challenging a, a hierarchical social order at the scales of building city and nation. And for me, what makes it particularly fascinating is, is this sense of it being an eager, eager anticipation of an imminent new future. <coughs> It's worth also just talking a little bit about Leslie Martin. Um, he graduated from Manchester School of Architecture in 1929 um, and was one of the first architects in Britain, maybe the first, to have a PhD. Um, he, by the end of the 30s, had built it with his uh, partner and wife, Sadie Spade, built a number of, mod uh, of early modernist houses. This is one called Brackenfell in Cumbria. Um, he also um, made friends with Ben Nicholson, the artist. Um, Martin Spate bought some of their, uh, you know, saved up to buy a painting, um, and they gradually became friends. Uh, and together they edited a collection of essays for Martin and Nicholson, along with Mount Garbo, edited a collection of essays called Circle, which was published in 1939. It's now um, often talked about as though it was a major event in um, art and architectural history, um, although, in fact, only a handful of copies were sold. Most of them were destroyed in favour of Faber's warehouse and bombing raid in 1941, um, but it was republished in the 70s, at which point it was talked about as though everyone knew it and had been rediscovered. Um, and Martin spent four years with um, London and the Scottish Railway, um, partly helping keep the trains running, but also um, prototyping and, stra and strategising for the post-war future. They developed all sorts of prefabricated um, buildings, including waiting rooms, uh, buffet, uh, you know, rest station restaurants and so on. They also worked on fabric designs, cutlery designs and so on. Um, and then not long after the war, Martin joined the London County Council, which was at that point Britain's biggest architectural practice and became the architect of the Royal Festival Hall, which was assumed to be the building that marked um, the re-emergence of uh, Britain from wartime uh, privation to you know, the festival of Britain as kind of anticipation of a, of a bright new future. And Martin felt that before the war, architecture, modern architecture had been fascinated by the image of science and technology, but that in the post-war period, <coughs> it should embrace the methods of science and technology. And that came from um, what he did at, at the RMS Railway, this um, research unit developing new building technologies, which he then sought to replicate at the RCC. Um, and there's a, an essay that he published in 1952 on the Festival Hall, a year after it was completed, called Science and the Design of the Royal Festival Hall. It's worth um, just reading at least some of this quote. Science can produce the facts, but art must show us the way in which they can be used. I do not want to be misunderstood at this point. I'm well aware that many scientists, not least Darwin himself, in their formal vision and in the presentation of their work, have seen and worked in some degree as artists. But in doing this, they've stepped outside the bounds of science. It's the scientist's province to provide facts, facts which can be clearly verified and demonstrated. Thanks to science, we may know the facts of sound insulation, of daylighting, of strength of, stru of, strength of structure. Um, uh, on, I do not wish to detract in any way from the value of these contributions. On the contrary, they immensely increase the comfort and convenience of human beings, and from this point alone must be welcomed by architects. But the sum total of all these facts can never tell us about how they should be used, for that is not a question of fact at all, but one of feeling. In short, it is the province of art. 
For this reason, it's clear that I do not believe that functionalism is an adequate theory or that science can and will take over and replace the province of art. On the other hand, I'm equally certain that the influence of science and the new facts which it presents can change art out of recognition. And you can look at Martin's post-war career, his research work, his building work, as being to do with the reconciliation of science and art in this way. That's what we consider that he was doing. And a big part of that was the work that he did at Cambridge, the Centre for Land Use and Belt Form Studies. Do any of you know that diagram? Have you seen that before? This is um, a famous breakthrough of the Centre for Land Use and Belt Form Studies. It's called Fresnel Squares. It comes from mathematics. But what they found really interesting about this is that each annulus, each strip around the edge of this square and the central square all have the same area. And they took that as a model for placing, as a, as, a, as a model for understanding how you can place buildings on sites. That, um, you know, that a tower might have the same area or the same footprint as a courtyard block of that size. And they felt that this was a major breakthrough in, in architecture. Um, they were interested in building types, libraries, um, university buildings, halls of residence, government buildings, and so on, and we're interested in finding the ideal building type for each type. And it's an idea of type as architect, I guess. Ideal forms as transcendent architectural truths. And for, the, for, for Martin, for Lionel March, for the other people working in the centre, good architecture had the reductive clarity, reductive power of a tightly formulated equation. This is architecture as diagram, architecture as formula. Um, and a lot of their studies came from this diagramming of built form on the site. Um, it related to all sorts of other things that were going on at the same time. This is, you, know, you can't see it very well, it's Fred from Darcy Wendt with Thompson's On Growth and Form, much loved by architects in the post-war era, which was looking at, at plants um, animals and fish and so on, and how the most efficient forms have evolved, um, as he argued. It related to also uh, Colin Rowe's work. Rowe worked in Cambridge with Martin in the 50s, um, where he was uh, diagramming architectural form. It relates to uh, Alexander's studies, Christopher Alexander's studies on that and the synthesis of form. And it produced all sorts of interesting things. This is a book um, edited by Lionel March. And uh, Philip Steadman, which is an architecture book, but it's full of formulae and graphs. You know, this is a uh, <coughs> transcendent architectural truth of uh, land use and built form studies, distilled in graph and formula form. And Anthony Vidler has written about this, uh, what's going on at this point as starting again with architectural history. Um, these guys were interested in Durand and Durand's comparative analysis of plan forms, but pretty much felt that what they would do, what they, what they, what, what they had done, was to find a new way of thinking about architecture. This is an, an, another way of conceiving of built form. You know, so much with architectural history, you know, we are we are on the trail of, of the truth of architecture here, and they felt that they were substituting the arbitrariness of the connoisseur with the logic of the scientists. This is Martin's reconciliation of science and art. Um, and it, in, in the White Hall Report, Martin talks about the idea of total plan. You know, echoes with Goebbels' total war, and right? slightly scary. Um, but that you know, this was a way in which built form could be efficiently resolved and planned as part of an efficient planning of cities, logistics, or of, of, of the technological future. It tapped into Norbert Wiener's work on cybernetics, which is in, in, envisaging all sorts of spheres of human life as systems. Um, it also tapped into uh, burgeoning systems planning. So, you know, building a city, logistics, politics, could all be connected together through systems planning and a new future anticipated in an orderly way. So what kind of architecture does this imply? Well, um, it's worth showing a couple of projects. This is Harvey Court, the Cambridge Hall of Residence project, 
uh, design with Wilson, completed in 1963, the same year as Wilson's White Heat of Technology speech, funded by the University Grants Commission, whose job it was to oversee the scientific expansion of British universities. Um, and it was a precursor to some of the studies that I showed you in the last slide. You know, these are things being done um, in the mid and late 60s. This was done you know, on, on the boards in the early 60s. But you can see underlying um, the plans the same uh, approach to the optimization of land use and built form as I considered it. You can also see the step section that recurs in the Whitehall project centered on a courtyard. Um, and the architects were interested in the optimization of planned sections so that each room would benefit as equitably as possible from sunlight, balconies, and proximity to bathrooms and kitchens. It was built with load bearing, constru wall load -bearing construction. Cross wall construction. And I think what's interesting about it in the context of uh, the idea of the new scientific meritocratic university is that each room both lit you know, literally and metaphorically supports the whole. You know, each of the, the walls dividing the rooms um, provides the structure for the building. Um, so each individual is located <laughs> equitably as the basic unit of a coherent architectural whole. It seems to me that this project is my cousin. Um, summarises the idea of society and the idea of architecture that underpinned Martin Whitehall plan two years later. It's imagined as an exercise in the fair distribution of resources to all, conceived scientifically, led um, in order to achieve this meritocratic new society. Uh, one of the things that's also interesting about it um, that recurs in a number of Martin projects and the other projects from this time is the building has multiple entrances. Um, there's no single front door. So the, the hierarchies of the plan are flattened to a good extent. Um, and that's interesting. I mean, you know, there's a building up, I know, similar sort of era on the University of Birmingham campus, which was built with multiple entrances, but recently <coughs> um, has been reoriented, so there's one entrance. It also has, a, has had a reception desk added which is never staffed. The university hasn't got the money to staff the reception desk, but the reception desk is there as a kind of token or talisman of the idea of the single entrance. Um, you know, so I think there's something fascinating about the buildings at this point with their multiple entrances, kind of challenging the much more hierarchical plan forms from before and after. This is zoology and psychology building in Oxford. Um, and it seems to me that this is the building where Martin and his associates came closest to applying to, to building the diagram, to applying the diagram to the site and constructing it. So this is conceived as a study in the optimum um, science building, the optimum laboratory building. Um, intriguingly, at that point, zoology and psychology were brought together because both of them were involved in animal experiments awful thing behind this building. Um, also in here, it's an anecdote, but it's kind of interesting, um, there's a lecture theatre which has uh, uh, an opaque glass uh, screen behind it and a room behind with mirrored glass so that a psychologist could talk to a patient in the room behind, so the patient just thought they were talking to the psychologist because in fact they were being watched by the whole lecture theatre. So there's some really quite spooky things in here. Um, and I think one of the fascinating things about it is that they just simply applied the Cartesian grid to the site. There's no reference to uh, Oxford's long architectural history or its picturesque townscape. This is the Cartesian grid rolled out um, on St Cross Road. Um, and uh, the ideal planning grid was so applied to the site. And you know, it's, it's one of the, it seems to be one of the few instances where architecture has overlaid Cartesian space on the messiness of a real site in the real world. And, and this is what happens. Rather than unsatisfactory results by conventional standards. There are all sorts of other interesting things going on. Um, multiple entrances, again, flattened hierarchies. But also, the same specification and finishes can be found in the basement plant rooms as everywhere else in the building. So the same floor finishes um, in the plant room as in the, in the teaching rooms, the same ironmongering, the, the, the same doors, and so on. 
Um, and so again, this is the kind of this is sort of, seems to me to be part of this the idea of this building as universal space, as Cartesian space, as the diagram applied to the sun. Flattening hierarchies again. Materials, hierarchies of materials, hierarchies of entrances, hierarchies of circulation. Okay, so that's the end of the white heat part of this lecture. Um, and it's worth just summarising some aspects, at least, of the architecture of white heat that come across from the Whitehall plan and some of the other Martin buildings. This is an architecture imagined as the functional, efficient contribution of architects as scientists and experts to a new scientific jet age future. This is rational, functional planning, a timeless idea of the building type. From, in Martin's terms, this is science and art reconciled in a new way. Um, there's a very particular politics of materials, um, the flattened hierarchies of um, geology and psychology, for example. There's also a thing about the hierarchy of entrances and circulation. And the idea, in particular, the idea of a new scientific future somehow opposed to the idea of a long culture. Right, so onto the, the, the design projects. Um, so some of the things that we've been working on, projects we've been working on this design office, include some work to some of the university buildings. Um, and Newcastle, the Newcastle campus has its own um, homage to the, the opposite, homage to the era of white heat. A series of buildings built in, in that um, small period of British history between Harold Wilson's white heat of technology speech and the devaluation of Sterling between 63 and 66. Um, these were funded by the University Grants Commission, again as part of that expansion of science in British universities. So you have the Claremont Tower, a building called Mertz Court, um, uh, this is a building called Dave's Fine Art Extension, a building called Building Science, which the School of Architecture that I teach in occupies. It no longer has um, building science labs in it, but has studios in it, which is part of what we were doing. Um, built in brown brick, um, an architect, Richard Shepherd Robson and partners, and they talked about creating an atmosphere of massive calm among the warring elements. That was their uh, <laughs> description of the project. Um, some images from the brochure. This is a town planning lecture going on. Um, there is one woman, actually. I thought it was all male at first, but not quite. Um, and this is the Claremont Tower, looking clean and fresh. Um, and you can see here the subjects that were in that building, or you could if you could read it. Things like computing, traffic engineering, town planning, um, and so on, and more computing in the basement. This is, you know, this is a hub of the white heat of technology. This is where all of this scientifically planned new future will be manufactured. Um, interestingly, Mertz Court, one of those buildings was opened by Harold Wilson, on 7th of May 1965, the Whitehall report was delivered on the 20th of May 1965. One of those little coincidences that sends a little shiver up my spine. Um, it's a model of Mertz Court. Interestingly, in that building in the foyer is this piece of scientific kit, now disused. I have absolutely no idea what it does, but you can imagine kind of plugging someone into that Frankenstein style. <laughs> Curious thing. Um, apparently, uh, the Wilson government uh, also had a, a machine in the Treasury uh, with chip glass tubes full of coloured liquid, which was used for um, uh, modelling economics in some way or another. I've been trying to find a photograph of this, but apparently it was used as economic modelling. I kind of can't help seeing this somehow as associated with it. So, one of the things that we've been doing... Uh, through design office is trying to help the university understand some of these buildings that they've got. They don't like them. Um, although they work quite well, um, they, they don't fit the image of the university that the university feels that it now wants to project. You know, somehow, um, <coughs> these buildings are found by many of their users <coughs> and um, by many of the, the senior management of the university somehow to be alien to the, to the culture. And, but actually, they're really, you know, looked at with an architect's eye, they're really rather good. You get games going on like the strips of window applied to the face of the brickwork, a column disappearing up behind the glass, then popping out in a strip and disappearing behind the glass again. This building um, has 
two openings, two holes cut through it, at ground floor, one at ground floor, one up here. So you know, there's, there's a game going on of flush surfaces and holes that are out. Um, you know, just as Leslie Martin was very keen on Ben Nicholson, somehow I can't help seeing this as being kind of Ben Nicholson really imagined in that way as a facade. The first project that we did was working with the University of States Department. They, they, did the, they were doing the design work and we interfered. Um, this is a project um, for a new foyer in, in the Claremont Tower building that I showed you that section through. It, did a re it was originally conceived as a kind of undercroft space with a concrete soffit, with a concrete paved floor. By the time, before, I hadn't, unfortunately I haven't got any before photographs, by the time we found it, it had all been painted cream um, with a green carpet tiled floor um, and you know, the usual fluorescent lights hung from the ceiling and so on. Um, so one of the things that we wanted to do was to help restore this space to some extent to the, the qualities of an undercroft. Um, also to try and try not to obscure the legibility of the building's rational and efficient planning. The scheme that the States, the States Department first came up with had sort of swooshy um, patterns in carpet and swooshy bits of ceiling and so on. Um, so we were trying to, to not, not do that. Um, one of the interesting things that came up through this was, first of all, talking about the idea of returning it to being an undercroft with various people in the university. <coughs> we, could, you know, we, could, we could strip the concrete, we could put new concrete slabs down. That didn't go down at all well. That wasn't the image that the university felt it wanted to have in itself. Instead, I realised as soon as we started talking about um, timber, you know, new timber doors and oak, um, well, what about doing the floor in granite? Um, that suddenly became much, a much more acceptable idea. You know, there was something about the politics of those materials, the long history, the idea of oak, the idea of granite, the reassurance that become those, those names carry with them, but also the materials seem to embody. Um, so somehow much more acceptable, so that was what we ended up doing. I mean, well, also, um, this foyer, it's hard to see in these photographs, has a number of entrances, we added another one, so rather than going back to the idea of the single entrance, we tried to maintain the, the multiple entrances, and also we enjoyed some architectural references, so we found this wall and this column with a series of oak slats, um, in reference to Alvar Alto's um, cladding of vertical surfaces often in tile but sometimes in timber, um, which was itself a reference to the fluting of classical columns. Um, and so to some extent we felt that we were, we were not just in terms of materials but also in terms of details beginning to imagine reintroducing the idea of a long, a long culture in the context of these buildings that were conceived in terms of rejecting a long culture and instead in, um, manifesting a new future. Um, this is the project we did for Mertz Court, uh, or part of it, which was about making new entrances, a clearer courtyard in here which had got full of clutter. Um, there was a, this cantilever box which had become a porter's office with the glazing obscured. Um, so we reopened that and made a new kind of student social space in there. Um, but the main project that I want to talk about is this one, which is called, it's called Building Silence. Very, you know, very white heat. Um, yeah, it was at one point home to um, a number of building science researchers. Uh, it was originally connected to the architecture building, um, which is which is this building here behind, which is um, an early 20th century building on the University of Quadrangle. This is the back of it. It was originally connected with a bridge here. You can see that patch of brickwork where the bridge was removed. The bridge got rotten and there was, they didn't want to replace it. Although when they took it down, they discovered one of the university's primary data cables was in the bridge. So that's remained as a zip wire connecting the two buildings together. They couldn't take that down. Um, but the other end of the building, facing the Claremont Tower, the Claremont foyer is over here. There's an undercroft space, partly enclosed, with the emergency escapes there, partly open and used as a car park. That's um, those are the original drawings of the building. You can't see them at all because of the projector, but there we go. Um, it's worth, it's, it's amusing to mention that the entire building was built off this one drawing. Um, the work that we did, which is a relatively small 
Um, refurbishments came primarily interior. We've done off 28 drawings. And that wasn't quite enough. But, you know, it's, it's an interesting indication of the shift in approach of construction that now you have to, you know, from a legalistic point of view, provide that many drawings. Um, so that's, that was where the bridge was that disappeared. Um, one of the things that we did was to have a student, partici uh, a, a, a student participation exercise in the school to try and find out what the students wanted from their spaces, including building science. I also ran what we call a research project with another stage five and stage six students who went on to do self-build projects around the school in other ways. So this was also connected to that. Um, but they made a, se there were a series of games at night. The school funded the, the alcohol. Um, students provided the, the, the kind of participation games of different sorts. But everyone began by collecting a bag which had a map in it and a pair of corb specs. So the whole evening everyone was walking around wearing these, these corb specs. Amazing. Um, anyway, so the project that we set out to do, first of all was to make a new entrance in that undercroft space at the back. Um, secondly, uh, we were interested in connecting the school of architecture together, which is in the architecture building and building science and has two floors in the Claremont Tower by making a route through. Um, <coughs> one of the things, the conditions for getting the money was making the building more accessible so we could lift in. The most remarkable thing was that in, in the centre of the building, very deep in the building, was a triple height test chamber. This was, construct, this was built in order to test um, full-size bits of building technology in the 60s, you know, complete with crane um, and all sorts of other kind of test gear. It had become more or less disused by the time we inherited it. The door at that point was, was this amazing kind of um, uh, airlock door. Um, so one of the things we wanted to do was to open that up and make a new crypt space. And we were also interested in using the building um, to help teach students about architecture, you know, kind of basic things like exposing services and so on, if possible to show that, to try and reveal construction to some extent. So what we did, in effect, was to insert a series of elements. Um, first of all, reinventing the test chamber as a crypt space, um, putting a mezzanine in it, which we called the nest, um, then making a new foyer space, um, in there, um, which included a cabinet whose proportion to displaying student models, whose proportions were modelled on the Unité in Marseille, um, and reusing what had been a studio as a crypt space, making a route through en filard from the entrance through the test chamber to the crypt, to the, the new, crypt, new social space, um, making a Taking out some offices on the top floor to make a computer room. Under the university's room number system, it ended up as room 101, which I rather liked. Um, so we call it that now. Uh, and then also, at the other end, where the bridge had been, making a, a bay window, an oriel window, which was, a, to some extent, a, a memory of where that bridge had been, but also an entrance signifier for what was otherwise quite a lost entrance in that lane. Uh, and then yeah, that involved making this new route through the school. So, um, a couple of sketches, uh, and then that's it. Um, so that's the new entrance, complete with unitary cabinet, entrance box, that's the full day space, my favourite cabinet again. Um, in terms of the unitary roofscape, we screwed some galvanised buckets to the top, it's sort of an abstraction of the unitary roofscape, two of them have got uplighters in, trying to persuade the University of Science Department that First of all, we wanted to do this cabinet. Secondly, we wanted to screw some buckets on the top in a quite prominent place in the university. And thirdly, we wanted to put some uplighters in it. It's quite a task. I acknowledge this. Um, this is the test, triple height test chamber reinvented with the new doors. We managed to leave the crane despite <coughs> people worrying that students might hang themselves from it. It's hung well enough out of reach. So the mezzanine space has another cabinet along it. Um, that's the nest, the mezzanine space with its orange floor. Um, a couple more shots of that. Uh, another cabinet with a door in it in the, in the research lab in the crypt space. 
And then that's room 101 on the top floor where we managed to persuade the university again that we should take, we take the suspended ceiling down and then just um, uh, lacquer rather than paint the, the ceiling, which is this amazing concrete, um, concrete and clay block construction with this brilliant dribbly concrete around the edge of the, of the blocks. Uh, most, most people hate it. I think the university is still out to try and paint this, but I'm resisting as much as I possibly can. So, design project which we understood, at least in relation to some of those architectural principles of YP. Firstly, um, you know, all of these projects, we, we try to recognise the rational, functional planning that's going on, the, the idea of the building type, um, as a timeless ideal, try to work with this idea of politics of materials, of um, flattened hierarchies, multiple entrances, um, and the white heat idea of you know, recognise the white heat idea of a new scientific future as opposed to the idea of a long culture, and, and to effectively add another layer, not to obscure the legibility of that rational and efficient planning, to try and maintain flattened hierarchies, multiple entrances. To work with the politics of materials which people now in the university could find acceptable, reassuring and rich materials, sup but supplementing to some extent rather than removing the original finishes, and also recognising you know, that idea of a new scientific future is it now itself a historical phenomenon. So, this is my way of conclusion really. The future that these buildings were imagined to represent in the 1960s and which was understood as a cause that required the rejection of the past, is now largely lost to us. In these projects we've sought to add the references to the past, which many people now find to be missing. We've chosen to refer to the historical objects of modernism alongside the longer politics of materials. In doing so, it becomes clearer that the future imagined by modernism is now out of reach, and that modernism itself has been reassumed into a long history of architecture. In this context, our details, with the quotations of Alfred and Cabuzier, attempt to reinforce an idea of history which includes modernism, not another kind of contemporary history which seeks to reject modernism as alien. I hope that makes sense. So to come back to research by design, if research is an original contribution to the culture of the discipline, then the Whitehall book probably is research by the conventional measures that universities find reassuring based on archive research, it's trying to synthesise in, in, in an original way that material. The projects that I've shown you probably wouldn't, in those terms, be, be research on their own. No, they're not brilliant projects, they're interesting, but they're, you know, kind of, they're small, they're probably not kind of, you know, all singing, all dancing, AR material, kind of trying to be good ordinary projects. But, in conjunction with the appreciation of white heat and its architectural culture that emerges from the book, they do become an original contribution, it seems to me, at least in the field of conservation ethics. This idea of trying to um, retrofit uh, the future with, with a past, to try and retrofit modernist buildings with an idea of a longer culture in order that people may find them success, may find them more acceptable in a contemporary culture. And you know, the book would have been much poorer without the opportunity to think through that lost future of modernism and its application of the past um, without the help of those buildings. So in that sense, I think the two taken together are I hope greater than the sum of the parts, that the projects maybe do become research in conjunction with the book. I hope that makes sense.